Uday Prayas operates in 10 states of India, uh, including, uh, let's say, from Kashmir to Andaman Nicobar Islands, from Arunachal Pradesh to Gujarat, 10 states, including Bihar, Gujarat, Assam, Jharkhand, uh, Haryana, Rajasthan. Prayas today is served by more than 600, nearly 610 co-workers we have who are full-time workers in the organization. Prayas runs uh, 164 centers across 10 states of India. And uh, day-to-day, nearly 40,000 beneficiaries come to the organization every day. Because nearly five to 6,000 live with us full-time because Prayas runs 38 homes and shelters for children, for women, for homeless. So that's a big chunk of it. Prayas runs 62 centers for vocational training, which means about 15,000 trainees at any point of time. Then we are running major health projects across the country. So it runs education program, vocational training program, child protection programs, juvenile justice programs, trafficking programs. So it's a large number of people. It's primarily a service delivery organization. 24th of uh, March, 2020, when the prime minister announced the historic kind of lockdown, as you know, lockdown created huge problems otherwise, uh, where I think the voluntary organizations were far more connected and they had to be connected. 24th of uh, March, 2020, I was on the television watching and suddenly I hear the prime minister announcing it. The first thing I did immediately, I heard it and I contacted the key functionaries of Prayas. I told them before next morning, you have to shift bag and baggage to all those uh, programs and services which you can't discount. So they shifted immediately. That is one. Secondly, I met all my health workers, nearly 100 of them. They work in the organization. They are doctors, they are nurses, paramedics, ambulances. We run many ambulances, mobile services. More than 300 co-workers of Prayas became frontline workers straight away. So this is one thing which was very important. Fortunately, during this period, Prayas received tremendous support. So we must have received nearly two crores during the entire period, you know, a little more than that. And uh, through that, we fed about uh, nearly 6.5 lakh people. Then we ran quarantine. There were quarantine centers at that point of time. Six quarantines were started in Arunachal Pradesh. In Delhi, we set up isolation centers. In fact, there's four isolation centers, homes for the homeless, uh, likewise. We uh, tied up with some of the hospitals, uh, for example, the Hindu Rao Hospital, and we provided them full arrangement of ventilators, nearly 30 lakhs. We gave it to Hindu Rao Hospital. Now, the second part, which is uh, perhaps far more important, I mean, the 32 lakh, 3.2 million voluntary organizations of India, they were uh, thrown in a corner, suddenly thrown in a corner on 24th of March 2020, when Prime Minister announced lockdown. So soon after it happened, I talked to Mr. Amitabh Kant, CEO of Niti Aayog. I spoke to Rajiv Kumar, the vice chairman of Niti Aayog. Harsh was always there with us and the Vani team was always there with us. We made them contact the voluntary sector. They wrote to all chief secretaries. They wrote to all district magistrates and requested them to come forward and to associate voluntary organizations. I mean, they were given passes, they were allowed and they became part of the district administration. One more point I would like to refer and appreciate Niti Ayo. The voluntary organizations did not have this kind of privilege of being called frontline workers. And thanks to Niti Ayo again, they wrote to the health secretary, government of India, that voluntary organizations, whoever are working in the similar kind of activities as government, should be categorized as frontline workers. The role of voluntary organizations in this entire COVID-19 situation is very, very significant. The biggest challenge uh, comes, you know, on, on account of the resources, the funding. Fortunately, Prayas could manage it. And uh, uh, I rarely accept this situation because funding for service delivery organizations is a bigger problem, in fact, than funding by other organizations. To feed these 0.63 million uh, cooked meals is not a joke. You understand that? You know, whenever I used to come every second day, there would be at least 200 people waiting outside for food. They were in huge crisis. There are thousands and thousands of domestic workers. We conducted a study. We found that they lost a job, all of them. 90% of 20 million domestic workers are women and they all belong to very, very kind of uh, unorganized sector and uh, conditions where they don't have resources to look after themselves. Mm -hmm. So how to reach out to them, creating, you know, kind of transportation for them, having people to work for them, and most importantly, how will they do? Frontline workers, you know, the loss of lives and all those things happen. We had loss of life also, some of the Prayas frontline workers. 
So of course, this is something very important. There are huge limitations of online activities. Hardly eight to ten percent of the entire children's population, school go- school going population, could avail of the online education program. So children suffered terribly. Uh, I would like to say that uh, these challenges have to be combated or have to be tackled by the voluntary organizations at all levels. Those organizations who are into activism, those organizations who are into documentation, those organizations who are into awareness programs. Community connect you have, but the risk in the community connect, the risk in direct services, I like it. So that was the biggest challenge I would like to say. And then inability to get the support, the vaccination of the frontline workers from the voluntary organizations was an issue. First wave, our activities were uh, of a much better quality because it was prolonged. It gave us a lot of opportunities to prepare ourselves and to come in the field. The second one uh, took us completely by surprise. Here, the frontline workers, their family got so badly bogged down uh, with the uh, situation. So that became a little difficult, quite difficult, really. It was far more devastating and uh, work did not satisfy us. Huge frustration, which I suffered myself. Most powerful intervention of the voluntary sector was in terms of reaching out to people who needed food, which was a basic thing. So this entire process of migrant workers movement, I think that was the most important area where the voluntary organizations supported and they really helped them. And coming to creating awareness, awareness programs and hardcore awareness programs, what all to be done, what precautions could be taken, you know, like mask and distance and sanitizers, all those things, uh, I think the voluntary organization did a good job. A large number of voluntary organizations, they produce masks in millions and millions. Masks were not available. PP kits were not there at all. Now, these creation of PP kits and creation of masks and distribution of these items in the communities, I think voluntary organizations did a great job. Well, I think that uh, justification of the voluntary sector, the justification of voluntary organizations in a country like India lies in direct services, lies in working into communities, lies in trying to find out who are they, whom are we supposed to serve directly. There is a screeching figure that 32 million children, they happen to be out of school. Nearly 35 million children happen to be children in need of care and protection. They are working children, they are homeless children, they are destitute children, they are orphans and those kind of children. They They should be the target and the poorest of poor. You have to work for them. Their socioeconomic deprivations, these are the areas where we are supposed to work. Uh, Well, I think the bigger organizations giving leadership uh, should also join hands in direct services. There is absolutely no competition in the world of services. And then uh, no voluntary organization can justify its existence if they sit in the periphery. We are not supposed to be in the periphery of activity. We are supposed to be midstream. We are supposed to be in actual activities. The lesson which I draw out of this pandemic is that more of us should be in more of services, indirect services, and then create linkages so that we are able to work as direct partners, integrated partners with other collaborators, with other stakeholders.